So I now have the pleasure of introducing uh, Zach Serber from Zimmergen, a founder and chief technical officer. Um, I met Zach, I hired Zach, I think, at Amaris, maybe seven years ago, eight years ago. Eight years ago. Um, uh, because he was a friend of one of the other founders. Um, this was pure nepotism. Uh, and, and I interviewed him and I said, well, what, what do you know about biology? And he said, well, actually, I, I'm a physicist, I think is what you said. Uh, and I know very little, which was perfect because we needed to change the way things were done in biology and an outside perspective was really great. Um, Zach was put in charge of a group called Gene Tricks to come up with new ways of putting genes together. Actually, the full name was Stupid Gene Tricks, uh, a la David Letterman. And the challenge was to take something from the lab uh, and an academic experiment to something that actually worked and to, could deliver meaningful progress. Zach has his own company now, Zymergen, and I'm very proud to announce him here at the DARPA event. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. That's a really nice introduction. And I certainly have been on a wild ride these last eight years participating in Amaris and then starting my own company about two years ago. And I'm really happy also to follow Jack because there's a similar theme to our talk. I'm going to talk to you about how we're going to use biology to make impossible materials. And as critical as I begin to define terms, what is an impossible material? And I'd like to go to history to give you an example. Bear with me. In Mesoamerica, pre-Columbian society, there was a ball game played that was a, a center of culture, politics, religion. In this schematic of a temple complex in the Yucatan, behind the main temple is a ball court. Places like Chichen Itza, which are amongst the most excavated, there are 13 ball courts. And the early European explorers encountering these ball courts took copious notes, but bizarrely, we don't know the rules of the game. No one bothered to record that. And a possible explanation for why the rules of the game were overlooked was that too much was written about the ball itself. People were utterly fixated on the ball. And an early Italian explorer wrote about 500 years ago, when the balls touch the ground, even though lightly thrown, they spring into the air with the most incredible leaps. Well, he can be forgiven his clunky language to describe this, because back then, there was no word for bounce in either Italian or Spanish. In Europe, they had ball games as well. They tended to be leather, balls stitched together, stuffed with wool or feathers, and behaved very differently than the balls that they encountered in South America and Central America. And I have examples here of the two kinds of balls. Let me switch. So this would be a Mesoamerican ball. This would be a European ball and they had that kind of different property. We can, with our modern perspective, explain more carefully what the Europeans were encountering the first time and explain their shock and awe. This is an Ashby chart invented by a Cambridge material engineer uh, to describe two properties of matter measured against each other. The, the properties you can plot are arbitrary. In this instance, on the x-axis, we're plotting the density of matter versus the Young's modulus, which is fundamentally a measure of the flexibility or stiffness of the material. And if we cast our minds back to medieval Europe and think about the materials available to them back then, they were primarily wood, ceramics, including porcelain and brick and metal. And there was a natural correlation between stiffness and density, such that if you wanted a mace, you made it out of metal. If you wanted a bow, you made it out of wood. This experience with materials would have been so second nature to you growing up in the society, so ingrained that you would be forgiven for thinking that this correlation between density and flexibility was a natural law, something that was intrinsic in the way the world worked. Until you found the new world, rubber is distinctive in that it's a vast outlier from the norm. It was to the medieval Europeans an impossible material with behaviors that could not be explained by anything that anyone had ever seen before. So for the purposes of this talk, an impossible material is one that upsets our sense of what a material can do. All right? Well, what preconceptions do we carry around today about the nature of materials? Here are a, a, a random list that I came up with in the hotel room on Sunday night. Old means failure prone. We tend to assume that if it's worn out, it's going to break soon. 
If something is light, we tend to assume it is also going to be weak. Wires are stiff. If you're trying to put together a circuit board, you're not going to be able to stretch the wire appreciably to connect two terminals where you can't quite make it. Glass is brittle. Bend it far enough, it will break. Plastics melt at modest temperatures. And corrosion is an inevitability. Imagine, if you will, a, set, a world in which we have access to materials that do not obey these fundamental assumptions that we have about them, in which materials will in the future exist that defy what we think now are natural laws but are not. We've heard from Alicia and Jack a bit about the petroleum revolution of the last hundred years. And the last revolution in advanced and impossible materials was uh, stimulated by the underlying chemistry available from petroleum and petrochemical building blocks. Life is chemistry. And the chemistries of life are intrinsically more varied than those that are arrived at through petroleum distillation and cracking. To date, and without even trying very hard, scientists have characterized over 200,000 molecules available there. These chemicals are fundamentally responsible for enabling life to exist in all the ecological niches that they occupy. They do the things that make each species differentiated from one another. We think there are millions more chemicals to be discovered, and I am certainly not including in this list uh, polymers like proteins. These are relatively simple chemicals. Petrochemicals building blocks are limited. On the, on the left is a barrel of oil, and you may know that the majority of a barrel of oil is actually used for energy. It's burned, about 85% of it. The remaining 15% is used in material science applications, used to make the plastics and the things that make up our modern lives. The amount of economics associated with that 85% and 15% are roughly equivalent. They're both about $3 trillion markets. There are a lot of advantages to this model, but there are some disadvantages as well. For one, the components of the barrel of oil are intrinsically linked in their ratios. They cannot be arbitrarily pulled apart. So you may notice that the price of diesel and gasoline trend together because you cannot arbitrarily decide, ah, there's more demand for diesel because people are uh, uh, embracing the new diesel efficient emission reduced cars, you can't just turn on the spigot and make more diesel fuel without also simultaneously making more gasoline. And similarly, the economics of all the materials that are derived from a barrel of oil are similarly coupled to the energy markets, which causes a lot of price instability and problems of the sort that Jack was referring to earlier. Biology provides a far richer palette of chemicals to begin with. And here is a random selection of chemicals, including farnesine, which Jack talked about as a precursor for squalane. And if one delves into it and studies enough of these molecules, you arrive at what I think are three fundamental differentiators around what biology does chemically that you don't find typically in petroleum. Number one, biological molecules tend to have chirality or may have chirality embedded in them. What is chirality? Well, when you have a carbon atom in your molecule that is bound to four different things, you can have a left-handed version or a right-handed version. And typically, through chemical synthesis, you end up with an equal molar ratio of the two. Biology has a strong propensity to arrive at one or the other. What does this get you when it comes to actual applications? Well, certainly, a lot of drugs depend upon these chiral centers for bioactivity. And often, one of the expensive parts around using chemical synthesis for making uh, uh, pharmaceuticals is that you have to account for that uh, chiral center or multiple chiral centers. But in addition, when it comes to material science applications, these chiral centers, if you exploit them, can be used to imbue your property, imbue your material with distinct properties. May, many of you may have heard of polylactic acid, which is made from a fermentation product, made from lactic acid. And innovators in chemistry have found that by mixing the ratios of L and D versions of the lactic acid in the polymer, they arrive at fibers and sheets with very different properties in terms of melting temperature and strength. It gives you a whole new dimension in which to play with material science. Another virtue of bioarrived molecules is the use of heteroatoms. And a heteroatom is simply something that's not a carbon or a, or a hydrogen. And Things derived from petroleum are hydrocarbons. If they have more, they've been added subsequently to them through a chemical process. Biology nat natively engages in a whole bunch of additional atoms types and creates much more complicated molecules from a pure atomic point of view. Here we have toluene on one side and cysteine on the other. Cysteine is a nice example because it has oxygen, sulfur, and nitrogen all in a tidy package. 
And these allow you in your biomolecule to arrive at new and different functionalities. In particular, we are looking into making marine adhesives that make use of some of these additional atoms. And the delocalization of electrons that are intrinsic in some of these heavier elements allow for better waveguides and things used in optics. So if you want to make a fiber optic cable more efficient, you need to have a higher uh, diffractive index, and you can arrive at that with more electron-dense atoms. And finally, and this is a bit of a mouthful, multiple asymmetric reactive moieties. And by that I mean a backbone molecule will have attached to it in polymer chemistry and plastics reactive groups, moieties, that react with one another to form the polymer chains. In petroleum-based polymers, these are very simple constructs. They are typically composed of what are called AA and BB monomers, where your backbone in the AA case has two reactive moieties of exactly the same character, and they're symmetric. And in the BB monomer, you have two different reactive moieties. A reacts with B, and to form a polymer, you alternate AA, BB on onward. As you probably know, if you study biology, we're full of AB monomers, amino acids uh, being a keen example in protein synthesis. And there are lots of examples in biology of building blocks that have different reactive moieties that can be used to coordinate things in not just linear structures, but three-dimensional structures, and allow you to parameterize and add functionality to otherwise inert polymers. There's a lot of applications here in a variety of sectors. Well, I've been, a, I've been a bit evasive about the application spaces. I ask you to imagine where these can be applied. And the point is, there's so many, it's hard to even imagine. With this palette of additional chemistries, the opportunities are virtually endless. So how do we actually narrow it down? Well, first we go talk to material scientists and people who are in the, in the market, who know what matters to changing the game in terms of how performance is arrived at. These people, you might think, as I did, that material science was a sophisticated and, and, and that's not quite the right word, a mature enough industry that they had a grand unified theory of how to predict the properties of matter based upon the basic chemical structures. And in a handful of examples, that's kind of true, but for the vast majority of cases, there's a fair degree, a large degree of empiricism required. To know what the properties of the material are going to be, you can have some intuition from experience as to what it would be when composed of a new monomer or set of chemicals, but you don't really know until you test it. So we go talk to domain experts who know this intimately. We get their intuition to create a list of chemicals that they source by looking at our list of what we call bioreachables, those molecules, and Chris Anderson calls it this as well, those chemicals that can be made via biology. We offer those up to the chemists and the material scientists, say which of these look interesting to you, and assuming I can get past the initial skepticism that I am some a hippie from the Berkeley area trying to greenify the world, I can actually get them to engage with me in picking molecules out and their eyes light up. They're astonished by the chemical diversity available in nature and without exception, they've always found dozens of chemicals arrived at through biology, which you cannot get in the Sigma catalog. You cannot get from any other source that they want to make use of in innovating around material science. What they are doing fundamentally as we try to push the boundaries is mentally exploring the Ashby chart that I showed earlier. The white spaces, the areas where there is no material that satisfies the appropriate ratio between, say, flexibility and density, or strength and thermal tolerance, these are the greatest opportunities to create the next versions of impossible materials. I'm not going to say very much about this next point because Jack put it more eloquently than I could, but how do we go about doing this? You look at the roadmap of metabolism and a microbe. You rewire it extensively so that you take an input and make an output. Uh, Jack and I were involved in making artemisin in yeast. You can make lots of different chemicals this way, in excess of 200,000, presumably. And the number of inputs you can provide are measured in the dozens. So there's lots of flexibility here. And then to actually do manufacturing, you have the advantage over petroleum in that you can make neat chemicals. And by neat, I mean a discrete chemical that is unencumbered by the economics and the supply chain issues that come from making something from oil in which everything is linked together. This is a fermenter farm uh, where to make more, you just make another fermenter. When it gets into the nitty gritty about how you actually bring a microbe that makes a small amount to large amounts experimentally, engineering-wise, there's a lot to be said. And I'm going to try to summarize it here in this schematic. So a lot of development of new products, and this is fundamentally going from, on the far left, that tiny peak on the trace that Jack showed to a, a walloping peak. This is the path it covers, and it takes time and effort. And what everybody's trying to do is climb this curve as quickly as possible with least risk and least cost. 
I fundamentally think of this in three stages. The first stage is I call zero to MIGS. It's where you have to basically put in the basic genes that are required to make the product in small amounts. Back when I was a graduate student, there was this joke that there was the one gene, one PhD model. So you went to graduate school, you studied a gene intensely, and after three or four or five or six or seven years, you got a PhD for it. These days, we're a little bit further. It's more the one pathway, the one PhD, where this is fundamentally the work of graduate students at good universities will compose novel biosynthetic pathways, make some amount of some product, but it will be tiny. The next part is MIGS to KIGS. This is climbing the performance curve. This is almost never done in academia. And whereas in the past there was the one gene or one pathway, one PhD model, we now live in a world where it's the one optimization, the one scale-up process, one company model. More or less, and there are exceptions, but more or less the model to date has been a company gets founded around the prospect of taking something that was built in academia and scaling it up through a set of improvements. And we hope to completely break this paradigm by coming up with ways that automate this process, not just in the genetics and the actual wet lab work, but also in the optimization and the thinking that goes on to make it algorithmic. And finally, at the, t at the very tippy top, you may have already reached uh, commercial points. You may already have a cosmetic on the market, but if you want to go into the lubricant market or the fuel market, you really need to eke out the last bits of, of performance from the economics, and I call that kegs to commodity. This, as Jack alluded to, is often very unexpected. The routes to making these improvements cannot be predicted by any theory that exists today, which is both a challenge as well as an opportunity. Building a robotic facility to do the work, the wet lab work involved, can actually be done relatively quickly these days. And here is Zymergen's space in June of 2014. So this is exactly a year ago. And we took some investor money and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and started to build this out to realize a vision. On the bottom right is the human lab. It has lab benches like you'd find in most places. And you can see that it gets populated really quickly, within a week, certainly less than a month, and real work started going on. Building the robotic facility on the top left in that big open space takes quite a bit longer. And every day, crates come in and get unpacked, robots get set up, software gets written. It takes a lot of work and a specialized team to really pull this off. The biologists that occupy the bottom right room do not spend as much time as you might think in the top left room. They certainly are developing protocols to be automated, but they're not assembling the robots. They're not writing the code. One of the keys to success in this sector is to have an integrated team of people who know the biology, have an appreciation for automation and computation, and hire dedicated engineers to do software and robotics. Um, this is about to come to an end. This is not quite, this is probably back in March or so, and it's more or less done, more happened. So the before and after looks like this to this. And this is the state of affairs roughly when we accepted our Series A last week and raised a whole bunch of more money, principally to expand our operations. The demand for what we do is vastly exceeding our ability to deliver, simply because we don't have enough space, enough capacity to handle all the requests. Um, we make use of liquid handling robots, and I'm not going to linger on this slide, but this is just to show off the sort of sexy robot videos that are almost mandatory in this kind of talk. I actually want to talk about something a little bit more abstract, which is automating the physical engineering is just the beginning. And this is certainly riffing off of Jack's point around DNA is information, but the information exists in many levels and many layers, and we have put together what we call our technology stack. This would be a diagram very common in the Valley today to describe a new software company, because you have a suite of technologies that when put together are greater than the sum of their parts. In addition to being able to manipulate the genetic code nimbly and to make good decisions about what to do, you also have to attend to the phenotypes that you wish to improve upon. There is the test aspect of this, which also generates a whole lot of data. So the automation layer is what I showed you videos of in gray, the second from the bottom, but there's also a protocol layer on top of that, coming up with new methods for using the robots to best effect, to affect the changes you want. The data layer, this part uh, is proving to be incredibly important. We do not know, since so much of what we uncover empirically through our experimentation is unexpected, we do not yet have a data model to even encompass the data that comes out of our systems. So you need something incredibly flexible that you can retrospectively go back to and apply models. There is a revolution going on in databases, in machine learning, that create data structures that can accommodate 
structureless data and make it nimble and easy to mine subsequently when you have greater understanding from having done more work. And setting up the foundations for doing that in the beginning is critical to exploiting it in the future. And finally, on the top layer is the search layer. And Jack described what is incredibly powerful, which is enabling scientists to do more work per person by getting them out of the lab, taking their hands away from the problem, and allowing liquid handling systems to do it faster with greater fidelity and lower cost and greater throughput than ever before. We want to close the loop entirely and come up with an algorithm or a set of machine learning informed uh, processes, a heuristic that takes the information that has been gleaned in the past and generates the next round of designs automatically to basically search through genomic space to find opportunities for improvement and capitalize upon them in subsequent rounds of design build test. We're well on our way to building this and we have data around this which I don't have time to share today. A famous uh, technologist from the Bay Area who certainly would have understood this stack was, was Steve Jobs and he noted shortly before his death that the biggest innovations of the 21st century will be at the intersection of biology and technology. A new era is beginning and that we see uh, in the companies and the, and the programs supported by DARPA uh, ably. I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll be available in the coffee breaks if people want to talk.